Tony went on to become one of the first Marshall Islanders to graduate from college and focused on helping his people to extricate themselves from the legacy of U.S. nuclear testing in his island country. He played a key role in the negotiations that led to the first compact of free association between the U.S. and the Marshall Islands and his country's independence. And he participated in the development of the Marshall Islands Constitution. Tony has increasingly focused his attention on the challenges of global warming and its effect on atoll populations. In February 23, he addressed the United Nations Security Council on the threat posed by climate change to the Marshall Islands' long-term viability and survival. On April 24th of this year, the Republic of the Marshall Islands galvanized world attention when it filed landmark cases in the International Court of Justice against the U.S. and the eight other nuclear-armed nations, claiming that they have failed to comply with their obligations under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and customary international law. Those obligations are to pursue negotiations for the elimination of nuclear weapons. The Republic of the Marshall Islands also filed a companion case in U.S. Federal District Court. And for this courageous act, the Republic of the Marshall Islands is being awarded the Sean McBride Peace Prize by the International Peace Bureau in December. So please welcome Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. I, I am honored to be here. I, I am also very lucky to have this opportunity to thank you, all of you in this room, for all that you do, all that you believe in, all that you contribute to what we all think is a noble goal for all of us, the elimination of nuclear weapons. I did not bring any notes, and one of the things I must do also is to apologize for being a little late in arrival, because that may have contributed a little bit to our starting late. But uh, we left our stick charts, our navigational stick charts in Honolulu, <laughs> and I couldn't find our way most directly this morning. Uh, even if we did have them, I'm not sure if we could use them with all these tall buildings blocking the horizon. I come from the Marshalls, where we lie barely two meters above sea level. As an atoll vulnerable country, we now experience the impacts of climate change. Of course, the conversation is about 50 years from now, or even maybe turn of the century. But we like to remind people that for us it's existential, it is now, it is occurring, it is presenting yet another uh, obstacle to safety, to survival of our country. People often ask, why is it that such a tiny little Nobody Nation wants to undertake such uh, campaign, such programs of uh, international intrigue and attention. When uh, some in the United States have actually suggested that lifting 53,000 people off of these small islands and dropping them in Wyoming or Montana or some other uh, not so populated state would start solve the problem just as easily. We <coughs> have been under the control of foreign governments literally since our discovery. Uh, the influence of the early traders, the early whalers, the early missionaries, the trading that was going on between the large countries as to what happens to the boundaries of the Pacific protected us most directly between 1857 and now. Of course, much of that is history. 
But next year being the 70th year of uh, anniversary of the end of World War II, because Jackie has already given away my age, <laughs> uh, I will also be 70 next year, February. I think that relating some of the issues that have, have uh, risen between 1945, 44, 45, and now, and it's and their impact upon our, our, our country would be an important addition to this, today's discourse. All the scientific facts of climate change, and nuclear weapons, and uh, nuclear power are in the brains of the collective wisdom here today. But I think I'd maybe put a little bit of a human face into this dialogue to help understand why such a small little country would want to say and to do what we're doing in all of these areas, in all of these areas. At the end of World War II, the United States decided that it was going to use the islands of the Marshalls and perhaps even the rest of Micronesia, then known as the Trust Territory of the Pacific Islands as a strategic trust territory. They closed it off to any intervention from anywhere and allowed itself through the trust, trusteeship agreement specific to the island, the power to develop bases and to test nuclear weapons. Because of that, the United States did not allow anyone in or out of the island without the express permission of the Admiral in Guam until 1968. There was no foreign investment allowed in these countries of the Marshalls, the United States of Micronesia and Palau until 1973. Our entire future was based on the American interest in developing weapons and keeping the rest of the world from knowing exactly what they were doing. To this day, we are still trying to find out exactly what they were doing and are still running into severe obstacles to obtain the necessary information, still classified and considered secret in the interest of the United States. So when we decided in 1968 to go for independence for the Marshall Islands, to restore what we believed to be sovereignty stolen, we had not just a trusteeship agreement to terminate, but we needed to find a way to ensure that those obligations that the United States undertook in its acceptance of its role as administrator for the trust territory would have a way for forward to being completed because obviously we were ill prepared for independence even though the trusteeship agreement stipulated that it was the function of the administering authority to prepare us for independence. We were offered alternatives. We were told that perhaps if we chose Commonwealth we might be better off than if we opted for independence. And this was part of the reason it took 17 years to negotiate the termination of the trusteeship and the recognition of the independence and sovereignty of the Marshall Islands. But throughout the whole process, the one thing, well, the two things really, I should say, but many people consider them to be one and the same. The two things that presented the greatest obstacle to agreement with the United States was the United States' insistence that it would still retain absolute military power in the islands forever. Forever. And two, how to deal with the damages of the nuclear testing program that took 
from 1946 until 1958, 12 years, and the equivalent of 1.7 Hiroshima shots every day, or 80% of all of America's nuclear testing program. Many would have given up early in the game because it seemed that it was not possible for us to reach agreement on either the restoration of our country, the compensation for the people who had been injured, or for the rights to function as a real independent nation. So, in order for us, and the sine qua non too, in order for us to be able to, to have been able to convince the United States to go back into the Security Council and say, we allow the Marshall Islands to go free again, we have to do two things. We have to give them permanent rights of defense and defense authority. This defense authority and responsibility also includes what we call the defense veto, where the United States can, in fact, uh, prevent another country from investing in the Marshalls or doing something in the Marshalls that they, in, they would, in their view, interpret to be inconsistent with that authority. And second, we had to agree on what they call the 177 Agreement, the <coughs> Nuclear Settlement for damages for both personal and property stemming from the nuclear testing program. Without agreeing to these two items, independence would not have been possible. As it turns out, to this day, we are still arguing over those two <laughs> items. We have an agreement in place, we have a treaty in place, we have a U.S. law that was enacted putting the compact into effect, but there still is no agreement, there is no satisfaction on either count. As a tiny, vulnerable country, Beginning in the meeting in Rio in 1992, it became obvious to our leaders that not only were we straddled with these two very troublesome burdens of post-colonial existence, but that a new one was coming around with very real similarities. First of all, we were being affected by emissions of large developed countries, something over which we had absolutely no control, much in the same way we had absolutely no control over the nuclear weapons being tested in our islands and affecting the local population. Secondly, we did not have the voice to actually reach the rest of the world to convince them that this problem was for real even then, in 1992. Let me just digress a little bit. In Rio plus 20, uh, two years ago, three, three years ago, we actually read the same opening paragraph of our <laughs> original president's speech to Rio 1992, because 20 years later, we found ourselves in exactly the same spot we were 20 years ago, vis-a-vis -vis climate change. It is difficult for small island countries to argue their case before the world in the area of climate change, just as it is very difficult for us to argue in the area of nuclear contamination. So, why, why are the marshals fighting this fight, sometimes risking being called Don Quixote and other names uh, <laughs> <laughs> that uh, only the Jesuits forced us to, to learn in school? It is because we think that we have not only a righteous cause, we have a mandate 
that requires us to do this. I am a father of three, grandfather of nine, and great-grandfather of four. <laughs> I'm proud of it. But I must also tell them sometimes what I'm doing to make sure that their future is guaranteed. That they will have land, they will have a language, they will have a tradition, they will have access to their fisheries, their seabed, and the rest of the resources that God blessed them. And that some far away, distant, developed country is not going to continue to poison this earth in such a way that we cannot guarantee that for them. That is the human role I want to inject into this discussion. I thank you for having me here. We'll be in New York for a week talking climate change, but I'm sure you know that this other issue is not going to be far behind. Thank you so very much. Thank you.